I'm standing in front of the greatest pyramid in the land of Egypt. It was built by Pharaoh Khufu, or if you prefer his Greek name, Cheops, of the fourth dynasty. Experts and scholars still wonder today at these amazing feats of architecture and engineering. And later during the program, we'll be showing you the internal workings of this particular pyramid on a to scale model. In the meantime, however, let's go back in time with David Down as we take you back through the exciting history of the great dynasties of Egypt. Well, there were 30 or 31 dynasties in the history of ancient Egypt, depending on whether you include the last Persian dynasty or not. A dynasty, you know, is where a king is succeeded by his son, and so long as it stays in the family, it's a dynasty. Well, the first king of the first dynasty was a king by the name of Menes, and these kings were buried in what are known as mastabas. Now, these are stone mastabas over here of the fourth dynasty, but the kings of the first and second dynasty were buried in mud brick mastabas. Now, when we come to the third dynasty, there was a dramatic development, and we find that at Saqqara. Let's go there and have a look. We are now at the so-called Step Pyramid of Saqqara, which you can see over here. And in this pyramid, we have two significant steps forward. It was made for King Zosa of the third dynasty by his architect, Imhotep. And in the first place, instead of using mud bricks, as did the pharaohs of the first and second dynasties, it is made of stone. Pretty rough stone to be sure, but nevertheless it's made of stone. And secondly, we have here six stages altogether. First of all, it started off as a mastaba, and then four stages were placed on top of that. Then later on, two more stages, making six stages altogether. But how do we know that this is how the pyramid was built? Well, around the south side, where the stone robbers have removed the outer facing of the pyramid, you can see where the mastaba was originally. And then around the east side, you can see the joints. See where it's been added on here? And so the archaeologists have been able to put the whole thing together, and we know just how it was done. Now, the question is, where did this concept come from? Where did Imhotep get this great idea? It's assumed that he just had a brainwave and built up the stages one by one, thought after thought. I personally don't agree with that. I consider that this whole concept was buried, borrowed from Mesopotamia. You see, there was more communication between Mesopotamia and Egypt than is generally assumed, I think. And in Mesopotamia, where civilization began, we have what is known as ziggurats. For instance, there's the ziggurat of Ur of the Chaldees. There's the Tower of Babel in Babylon and there's Burr's Nimrod. There are numerous ziggurats, and they were stage upon stage. Now, the only difference was that whereas these ziggurats were used for worship, they used to go up on top there and worship on top, this idea was used for burial. So you don't go up on top. It was simply a burial chamber underneath. And actually, there's a more complex series of passages and tomb chambers underneath here than any other pyramid or any other burial place in the whole of the land of Egypt. It's absolutely amazing. Now, from here, we can see three pyramids in the distance as we look south, and they all belong to one king. Now, not even a god king can be buried in three places at once. So why did this king want three pyramids in which to be buried? <laughs> What you're looking at is not really the final pyramid. You're just looking at the square core. Originally, this was the first true pyramid form. Now, what we saw at Saqqara, so-called step pyramid, which I don't consider to be a pyramid at all, went up in stages. 
But here we have the development of the first true pyramid form. It went right up straight on the outside. But you'll notice that the outside is gone. It's fallen down. The question is, what happened? Well, it's like this. If we were to go in the entrance, uh, we would find that there's a descending corridor going right down and then a horizontal passage going along. And at the end of that, there are some large cedar beams there holding the stones together. And from there, we go straight up into the center of the very heart of the pyramid. And up there is the tomb chamber. But you'll notice something about it. It's not finished, never was finished. And after all, this is what a pyramid is all about for the burial of the king. That's the most important part. OK, so why wasn't it finished? Well, the question is, did this outside covering collapse slowly, disintegrate over thousands of years, or as Kurt Mendelssohn, an engineer incidentally, not an archaeologist, but maybe an engineer knows more about this, uh, he claims that it was a sudden collapse and it happened before the pyramid was entirely finished. And that would explain, of course, just why it was abandoned. After all, it must have been like an earthquake when it all came tumbling down. So what was the king going to do? Well, he could clear the rubble away and start again, maybe, but maybe there's some superstitious reason that he decided not to do that. And so he decided to go elsewhere. And so we have the second pyramid, which is the bent pyramid. Now, it's called the bent pyramid because it goes up at an angle of 54 degrees and then levels off to 40 three degrees. Now the question is why? Well, some people say he ran out of money, finished it off more economically. Others say he died and his son finished it off. Well, I'll tell you what his son would have been doing. His son would have been busy starting building his own, you see. So what is more likely is that he got it up halfway and then he realized that this also could collapse. Actually, there are some stress strains, some cracks in that pyramid which suggests there was a problem. Now, that being the case, maybe he said, well, look, we better finish it off at a lower angle so as to see that it doesn't collapse. But the stress strains were there. So maybe that accounts for the third pyramid. Now, the third pyramid, the red pyramid of Dasha, was finished off the whole thing at 43 degrees. And I guess he figured, well, here's one pyramid which is not going to come down on top of me after I'm buried there. So I think this is undoubtedly the reason why he had three pyramids. There's just one other interesting point about this, and that is people ask me, how long did it take to build the pyramids? Well, most people refer to Herodotus, the ancient historian about in the 5th century BC, who says that the great pyramid of Khufu, the ramp leading up to it, the causeway, took about 10 years and the pyramid itself 20 years. But listen, 30 years. The, the pharaohs didn't rule that long. They had no guarantee they're going to be still alive at the end of 30 years. But on the other hand, the bent pyramid of Dashur has an inscription down the bottom in which it refers to the 21st year of the king. And halfway up is another inscription with the 22nd year of the king. It means it only took one year to get from the bottom to halfway up. The whole thing probably finished in two years. So maybe Khufu's pyramid was finished in about two or three years. I think that's more likely. Well, you wouldn't want to have claustrophobia to go into that pyramid. And look, while we're here, just over there is a mastaba. I think we should go in there and have a look. The original entrance to this mastaba is round on the east side, but it was blocked up when the mastaba was first made, so nobody has ever gone in there since. But we have to go in here, which is the entrance that was made by the tomb robbers to get everything out of the mastaba of value. Well, you can see they didn't make a very big hole. In fact, you have to really squeeze through here to get into the tomb chamber. Now, when you get through there, you can see the stone plugs that blocked up the original entrance. That's why the tomb robbers had to make their own entrance. And here you can see the sarcophagus in which the body was buried in the tomb chamber. <laughs> well, it was pretty hard to get in and out of there. Well, now we go to the biggest pyramid of all, Senefru's son, Khufu, or Cheops. Thank <laughs> you. 
Well, this is the pyramid of Khufu, or Greek name Cheops. And what a massive monument this is. Do you realize just how many stones are in this thing? It has been estimated that there are 2,300,000 blocks of stone in this colossal monument. And on the average, each stone is about two and a half tons in weight. The biggest of them is 15 tons. You, you know, there's just so many stones in this pyramid that suppose we do it this way, if we took some of these stones and we cut them into pieces, blocks, uh, 30 centimetres by 30 centimetres, and we put one block here and another block beside it, and another one and so forth, just keep on going. Do you know we could go right round the coast of Australia and we've still only used half the blocks of stone in this pyramid. We could go right round again. That's a colossal number of stones, you know. Well, people ask me, how did they get these stones up there in the first place? There are no tomb inscriptions. There's no reference in any of the statements in the ancient writers as to how this was done. Uh, all we, the only clue we have is the fact that at Karnak, there is a pile on there, and there are some mud bricks going up, and they never removed them. And that gives us the clue that this was the way they got these big stones right up onto the top of these pylons or up these pyramids. So undoubtedly that's the way it was up here, no mystery about it at all. This pyramid is colossal. From one corner to the other is 229 metres. Now do you realise that in order to walk right around you're going to go more than one kilometre? The height is 146 metres. Well, that's what it is today anyway. You might notice the top is a little bit flat. It's 10 metres lower today. That's because local builders have taken stones from the top for their own building purposes in Cairo. Well, how was this uh, pyramid entered? What was it like at the beginning? Well, we'll go around the other side and have a look at that. Now, we're around the north side of the pyramid, and this is where the official entrance was. In fact, if you look up there, you can see the keystones, the arch, and that was where the official entrance was, and from there, a descending corridor slopes down right into the very heart of the pyramid. But in order to see just what the inside passages and tomb chambers are like, we need to have a look at a model of the pyramid, take it apart, and then you'll be able to understand what the inside of this pyramid is like. Now, you can see here the original entrance when it was finished, of course, this was covered up so that you couldn't see it. It's slightly off centre. Here's about the centre here, and here is Mahmoon's entrance where they illegally dug in there, and that's where visitors, tourists go in there today. I have made it so that we can take it apart, and you can see the passages inside. Now, over here is the entrance and the descending passage going down into bedrock, and then it levels off and goes to a tomb chamber, which is unfinished. Here are these... Uh, is the ascending passageway, and it was blocked off here with a slab of stone so that anyone going down here would not know that the passage was there. But that's the slab of stone that fell down when the workmen of Mahmoon started digging through there. You'll notice it's blocked up by three large slabs of stone here, and then the passage goes right up here. It goes level here, horizontal, to what is known as the Queen's Chamber, and there are two vents coming up here, only they go nowhere. Then here is the ascending gallery, and it comes up here and then levels off and goes into the king's chamber. And up the end there is the sarcophagus. There are five gaps above here to relieve the pressure of the immense, uh, enormous amount of stone that's above it, crushing it. And uh, it was in here that a workman had scribbled the name of Khufu, and that's how we can identify this pyramid. There are two small passages going up here. They're only small, and uh, air vents, what are they? I, I don't think so. But anyway, they come up here and uh, right out to the outside. So this gives you an idea of what the inside of the pyramid looks like. Now, there is one more very interesting aspect of this pyramid. People often ask me, how old are the pyramids? Well, by the usually accepted chronology, these pyramids were built about 2600 BC. But if we accept the biblical chronology, it means that the universal flood occurred about 2300 BC. Now, that means that this pyramid would have to be later than that. In fact, according to Dr. Emanuel Velikovsky's revised chronology, it would place it about the 19th century BC, and that would be about the time that Abraham 
visited Egypt. You know, you have the record in the book of Genesis of Abraham coming down here to Egypt and talking with the Pharaoh and so forth. Now, remember where Abraham came from. He came from Ur of the Chaldees. And Sir Leonard Woolley's excavations there from 1922 to 1934 revealed that the Sumerian civilization was the world's first civilization. And they had a remarkable understanding of mathematics and astronomy and uh, trigonometry and, and other sciences. Well now, Josephus, the Jewish historian, made a very interesting statement. And I want you to listen to what that statement says. Abraham communicated to them that is, the Egyptians, arithmetic, and delivered to them the science of astronomy. For before Abraham came into Egypt, they were unacquainted with those parts of learning. For that science came from the Chaldeans into Egypt. So, if that is correct, and Abraham came here during the time of Khufu, that would explain something very interesting. You see, this pyramid is exactly square. It is exactly level. It is exactly orientated north, south, east, and west. And if you were to take a circle with the top of the pyramid as the center of the circle and apply the formula 2 pi r, you would find that that would be the exact circumference of the base of the pyramid. Well, now, either that's a remarkable coincidence or it means that the Egyptians at this time knew the formula 2 pi r. And where did they get it from? Well, if Abraham imparted to them this knowledge, that would explain it all. And so it raises the interesting possibility that the Egyptians may indeed, as Josephus says, have learned their astronomy and their mathematics from Abraham, who brought it from Ur of the Chaldees. followed by Khafre, or to give him his Greek name, Kephron. And he built this next pyramid, not quite as big as the preceding one, but it's still a big beauty, isn't it? And the interesting part of this pyramid is right up at the top, do you see it, is still part of the stone facing that originally covered both pyramids. Tura limestone, beautiful white glistening limestone it was. Well, most of it is gone, taken by the stone robbers, actually, but there's that little bit still left up the top there to enable us to know just what these pyramids looked like when they were finished. Now, Khafre had an interesting system. He wanted to stay there forever. He wanted his body to be preserved forever. And so he devised an idea to guarantee that no tomb robbers would ever get into his tomb. Well, this was his idea. He had a sphinx made here. It was cut out of the solid rock. You, you see that knoll over there? Well, there was one like that here. And they cut the stone away from it and left this sphinx standing, a human face and a lion's body. It's 73 metres long and 20 metres high, and it has the face of Carfre, so we know it was meant to be guarding his tomb. But it didn't do a very good job because his tomb was robbed anyway by the tomb robbers. So we leave the pyramid of Khafre and we go to the next pyramid which is a lot smaller and that was the pyramid of Menkaure, or to give him his Greek name Mykerinus. It's a lot smaller, only about a quarter of the size of the preceding one. But the interesting part about this pyramid is that it was covered not with white Tura limestone but with this beautiful pink granite that was floated down the River Nile nearly a thousand kilometres from Aswan. And this covered nearly half of the bottom of the pyramid. Most of it has fallen down, of course. But uh, let's have a look at the top of this pyramid. It's rather interesting. at the top and believe me it's a long way up but it's worth it away out over there are the pyramids of Abu Sir now they're the pyramids of the Pharaohs of the fifth dynasty they're in very bad shape they have crumbled right down 
But I, in particular, I want to tell you about the last king of the fifth dynasty, whose name was Unus. So here we are at the Pyramid of Unus over there. It's in rather poor condition, all the outside stone is gone, but the inside is interesting. There's a new development here. Let's go down and have a look. way below ground level here, but Unus wanted his soul to have the impression that he was underneath the night sky, and so he had all these stars painted on the roof of his tomb chamber. As well as the stars on the roof, there's another very important feature here, and that is the introduction of these beautiful hieroglyphic texts in a tomb for the first time. Now, up until 1822, nobody could read these texts, but then came the Rosetta Stone. In 1798, Napoleon Bonaparte's forces crossed the Mediterranean and he occupied Egypt. Soon after, one of his officers was rebuilding a fort at a place called Rashid in the Delta, now known as Rosetta, and he found there a strange stone, which he sent up to Cairo. Subsequently, the British occupied Egypt and confiscated the stone. So the Rosetta Stone is now in the British Museum, and as you can see, it is in three different scripts. It was a French genius by the name of Champollion who was ultimately able to announce that he was able to decipher the Egyptian hieroglyphs in the year 1822. The way he was able to do it was from this Rosetta Stone. At the top, there is the Egyptian ancient hieroglyph pictorial writing. Beneath that, in the centre, is the demotic, which is also the Egyptian language, but in a cursive script. And down below here is the same message in the Greek script and language. Now, this could be read, the Greek could be read, and so by comparing this with the demotic and then with the hieroglyphs, ultimately, Champollion was able to announce that he could interpret the hieroglyphs. So now the Egyptologists can read these beautiful hieroglyphic texts, and the result is some very interesting light on a biblical story. Behind me is a hill on which once stood the ancient city of Dothan. And it was in this vicinity that one of those stories, which is sometimes stranger than fiction, took place. It was the story of Joseph, the son of Jacob. Jacob had 12 sons, and one of them was Joseph. The second youngest was Joseph. And Joseph was a very good boy. Jacob loved him very much, but he made the fatal mistake of showing favoritism towards this son. And he even made him what the Bible calls a coat of many colours. Actually, that's not a good translation. It should be a coat with long sleeves. Do you know why? Because if you had long sleeves, that meant that you weren't expected to do any manual work. Well, the other brothers, of course, had to go out and <coughs> do their work. And one day they left the home and went out with their flocks to Shechem. And after they were a while, away for a while, their father got a bit anxious and said to Joseph, you better go and see how they're getting on. So Joseph went. Now Joseph had had some dreams in which he dreamed that sheaves from a wheat field like this were bowing down, 11 of them were bowing down and worshipping him. And of course the brothers interpreted this as meaning that one day they would bow down to him. And of course they didn't like that. And uh, they resented this, you see. Well, when Joseph came to Shechem, he found that the brothers had already left and they told him they'd gone on to Dothan. So that means they came onto this place here. And uh, when the brothers saw Joseph coming, they said, aha, here comes that dreamer. Now listen, let's kill him and then let us see what happens to his dreams. And so they all thought that was a good idea. And so when poor unsuspecting Joseph came, they grabbed hold of him. But Reuben, the oldest of the brothers, didn't want to have to go back to his father and tell this story. And so he said, listen, don't let's kill him. Let us throw him into this pit, referring to a nearby cistern.
This well is at the foot of the hill on which Dothan is built. The stones up near the top are of fairly recent origin, but those stones down the bottom are very old. Well, it is possible that into this pit, which was dry at the time, Joseph was lowered uh, with the intention of leaving him there by the brothers. However, uh, after a while, Judah came along and he said, look, why don't we make a quick shekel out of this? And uh, a caravan of camels was coming along and he said, let's sell him as a slave. Well, these Midianite traders took Joseph down to Egypt and there they sold him to an officer by the name of Potiphar. Apparently, Joseph decided if he was going to be a slave, he might as well be a good one, and he was so reliable that Potiphar promoted him to be the head over his household. Unfortunately for Joseph, there was some false accusation made against him and he was flung into prison. Well, while he was in prison there, the two servants of Pharaoh, a butler and a baker, were also flung into prison and one day Joseph came along and he found them looking very disconsolate. And he said, what's your problem? Well, the butler said, we've had some dreams and we don't know what the meaning is. Oh, Joseph said, tell me, I'll tell you the meaning. God knows the meaning. So the butler said, well, I dreamed that I had three bunches of grapes and I squeezed them into Pharaoh's cup. Oh, Joseph said, that's easy. It simply means that after three days, you're going to be restored as Pharaoh's butler to squeeze the grapes into his cup. Well, when the baker heard that, he thought, that's pretty good. And he said, well, I dreamed that I had three baskets of, of bread on my head. And the birds came and ate up the bread. <laughs> Joseph said, that means that after three days, you're going to lose your head. Well, it happened just exactly as Joseph had predicted. And when uh, the butler was restored, uh, Joseph said, hey, just remember me when you get out because I shouldn't be in here. But unfortunately, the butler completely forgot about it. And it wasn't until about two years later that Pharaoh had a dream. And he did not know the meaning, called in the wise men, they couldn't tell him. And it was then that the butler suddenly remembered, oh yes, I remember that fellow in prison. So he told Pharaoh about it, and so Pharaoh said, well, bring him here. And so Joseph was brought in, and Pharaoh told him the dream. He said, I dreamed that there were seven fat cows came up out of the river Nile and uh, they grazed there. And then seven thin cows, so thin you couldn't believe it, came up, and they gobbled up the seven fat cows. Well, Joseph said, I'll tell you what that means. It means that there's going to be seven years of plenty, and that will be followed by seven years of famine. The Nile is going to stop flowing just about, and there'll be a famine. So you better gather together, appoint somebody to gather together all the grain during those seven years of plenty so that when the seven years of famine comes, you'll have enough to eat. And so Pharaoh said, well, that's a good idea. And what better person could we have to do all this than Joseph? And so Joseph was appointed as the vizier of Egypt. Now the question is, who was this Pharaoh? Which one? I personally consider that the chronology of Egypt needs to be shortened and in that case, this incident would take place at the beginning of the 12th dynasty of Egypt. And in particular, the pharaoh concerned would be the pharaoh called Sesostris I. And I think I have some good reasons for thinking that. This is a statue of Sesostris I. Actually, he's quite a nice looking guy, don't you think? Almost a smile on his face. And there's another group of statues in the Cairo Museum. They're clustered around a shrine. There's 10 statues altogether, and they're all identical. And they show him also as a nice looking fellow. And there's another statue that shows him as a shepherd with a shepherd's crook in his hand. In other words, he was looking after his people. He had an interest in his people. Now, he was the one who made this obelisk over here and it has inscriptions on all four sides, they're all identical, and this was the first large obelisk that was ever made. Now it is called the Pillar of On, and the biblical record says that Joseph married the daughter of the priest of On, and that fits right in in this place here. And so I would identify Sesostris I as the pharaoh under whom Joseph was promoted to be vizier.
Now there is something else. The biblical record indicates that Joseph was a very prominent figure. I'd like you to listen to what the biblical record says in the book of Genesis. Chapter 41. Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, You shall be over my house, and all my people shall be ruled according to your word. Only in regard to the throne will I be greater than you. And he had him ride in the second chariot which he had. And they cried out before him, Bow the knee. So he set him over all the land of Egypt. Now, did you notice just what respect was paid to Joseph? People bowed down in front of him. Now, that didn't usually happen with a vizier. But it so happens that under Sesostris I, we know from history that there was such a vizier. And his name was Mentuhotep. The very well-known Egyptologist, Brucht, described the activities of this vizier. I want you to listen to what it says. In a word, our Mentuhotep, who was also invested with several priestly dignities and was Pharaoh's treasurer, appears as the alter ego of the king. When he arrived, the great personages bowed down before him. So you see, this fits in very well with the biblical account, and we do have such a vizier under Sesostris I. But there's other evidence too to support what I'm saying. Well, here we are in the Fayum, this remarkable oasis that supports so many people. And here I think is something very significant. You see this canal, it's a very large canal, and it comes a long way and flows into this oasis which is below sea level and enters a vast lake. And it brings fertility to this whole area. Now, the interesting part is that this is called Joseph's Canal, and nobody knows where it got that name. It seems to go back a long way. And it is my opinion that this canal, which was dug during the 12th dynasty, the early 12th dynasty, was dug during the time of Joseph, who knew that a seven-year famine was coming, and so he had this canal dug to provide fertility to the land of Egypt during this time. Now, there's something else I think is very significant, and that is further downstream is a place called Beni Hassan. And at Beni Hassan, there are some tombs. And one of these tombs has on the wall a beautiful painting. Well, it used to be beautiful, it's faded now, of some Semitic immigrants who had come into Egypt. And there it shows the type of clothing they wore, the type of domestic animals they had, the type of weapons. And you'll even notice that this fellow had brought his portable TV with him. Well, actually, it's a musical instrument anyway. So this shows the Semitic immigrants during the 12th dynasty. Now, who were they? I don't say that they were Joseph and his family, but I do consider it highly likely that they were the Israelite people who had fanned out over the land, and this man thought it significant enough to put it on the wall of his tomb. Now, there is one more thing I want to tell you about. <coughs> One of these tombs was made by a man by the name of Ammoni, and he also was during the time of Sesostris I. And he left on the wall of his tomb a record of his good deeds. That's what they mostly did, you know, told the gods what a good fellow they were. And among other things, he referred to what he did to prepare for a coming famine. Now, Jan will read you a statement from a historian and a translation of this wall inscription. No one was unhappy in my days, not even in the years of famine, for I had tilled all the fields of the Nome of Ma up to its southern and northern frontiers. Thus I prolonged the life of its inhabitants and preserved the food which it produced. And so I consider all of this points to the fact that Sesostris I was the pharaoh under whom Joseph was the vizier of Egypt. Now we come to the fifth king of the 12th dynasty, whose name was Sesostris III. And I consider him to be the pharaoh referred to in the book of Exodus, chapter 1 and in verse 8, where it says, Now there arose a new king over Egypt who did not know Joseph. And he said to his people, Look, the people of the children of Israel are more and mightier than we. Come, let us deal wisely with them. Therefore they set taskmasters over them to afflict them. Well, I consider that by now Joseph would be dead and this would be the Pharaoh referred to in this verse. 
And believe me, he's a nasty looking character, just the sort of fellow you would expect to do this sort of thing. For instance, there is this statue of him in the Cairo Museum. Do you, do you notice the downturned, sour mouth that he's got and the nasty expression? And then here's another statue of him, a similar appearance. And then here is this sphinx of him. I, I just wouldn't like to know this fellow. And I think he's the pharaoh referred to here. Sesostris III was followed by Amenemhet III. And he also was a nasty looking character as his statues indicate. Here's one, for instance, in the Luxor Museum. And he reigned for 43 years. This is his pyramid that he built here. Not a very big pyramid today, but originally it was covered with stone and a lot bigger than this. Today, all that is left is the core of the pyramid, which is made of mud bricks that are laced with straw. In fact, you can see the little flecks of straw that were in there. And after all, that's what we would expect, isn't it? Because here in Exodus chapter 5 and in verse 7 it says, You shall no longer give the people straw to make brick as heretofore. Let them go and gather straw for themselves. So I think that this was the pharaoh who was responsible for this. Another interesting point is that Amenemhet III had a daughter, no sons. And that daughter had no children. Her name was Sebek Nefru Ray. And this would explain why she went down to the River Nile and saw the little baby Moses in a basket there. You might wonder, well now, why would an Egyptian princess take a little baby from the slaves and propose to make him the next pharaoh? Well, you see, she wasn't down there having a bath or taking a swim. She was down there for ceremonial purposes, worshipping the god Harpy, the river god, the Nile god, and he was the fertility god. And of course, she'd need a god like that if she was uh, infertile. And so she was down there worshipping the god Harpy, the fertility god. All right, and so she sees this little baby comes along and regards it as a gift of the fertility god Harpy. And I think probably she called him Harpy Moses. You see, Moses means drawn out of or born of. In other words, born of the river god Harpy. There are a number of pharaohs called that. For instance, there was Tutmosis, born of the god Tut. There was Ra Moses or Ramesses, born of the god Ra. So here we have Moses, born of the god Harpy. Well, he was the baby who was to become the next pharaoh, but he disappears off the scene. And it's not hard to understand why. There was a king by the name of Amenemhet IV, who was intended to be the heir of Amenemhet III. But suddenly he disappears from the scene. I think that was Moses myself, because he was forced to flee at the end of this man's reign. And so we come to the end of this dynasty, and I think it fits in very well with what we know of the biblical history. Well, now we're visiting the tomb of Sesostris II. Do you see it over there in the distance? also a mud brick pyramid. And this particular pyramid was made by Sesostris II and it was excavated by Sir Flinders Petrie in the year 1891. And Rosalie David published a book only in 1986 in which she highlighted some of the discoveries made by Petrie. And he found that there was an entire city here which was occupied by Semitic slaves, if you please. We'll go to the top of the pyramid and I'll point out the city from there. Well, I don't want to have to climb that pyramid every hot summer day. But from here, you can look out and see where the temple was and where the city was that Petrie excavated. Now, he found evidence there that it had been occupied by the workmen who lived and who worked on building these pyramids. And he concluded from the evidence that they were Semitic slaves. Now, there's something else that he found too. This book by Egyptologist Rosalie David was only published in 1986. And it is on the people who built the pyramids, the actual workmen, you see. It has in particular here a chapter called The Foreign Population at Cahoon. 
and it says, from his excavations at Cahoon, Petrie formed the opinion that a certain element of the population there had come from outside Egypt. Now, the archaeologists couldn't figure out who this foreign population were. It says here, it is apparent that the Asiatics, now an Asiatic is a term that the Egyptians used for somebody from Syria or Palestine or somewhere in that region. The Asiatics were present in the town in some numbers, and this may have reflected the situation elsewhere in Egypt. It can be stated that these people were loosely classed by Egyptians as Asiatics, although their exact homeland in Syria or Palestine cannot be determined. Now, the reason that they could not determine it is because I consider they have the wrong chronology. Therefore, they did not associate them with the Israelite slaves. I believe they should be identified as the Israelite slaves. It says the reason for their presence in Egypt remains unclear. In other words, we don't know who they were or how they came to be in Egypt. But put it with the biblical account and you have the answer. They were enslaved by the Pharaoh. Of particular interest, I think, is something that Petrie found under the floors there. There were boxes. Do you see the picture of the box here? Very well preserved. And this box was found under the floor, as boxes were under many of the floors of the homes. And it says, larger wooden boxes, probably used originally to store clothing and other possessions, were discovered underneath the floors of many houses at Contour at Cahoon. They contained babies, sometimes buried two or three to a box and aged only a few months at deaths. I think that's very significant. How did they get there? Well, we know from the biblical record that Pharaoh decreed that all the baby boys were to be put to death at birth. Some of the mothers managed to look after their babies for a month or two or three months as with Moses but then I can see the Egyptians coming along, wrenching them from the arms of the Israelite mothers, killing them, and the loving parents burying them in these boxes under their floors. One more significant point about this is as to where all these Asiatic slaves went to. Interesting, listen. There are different opinions of how this first period of occupation at Cahoon drew to a close. The quantity, range, and type of articles of everyday use which were left behind in the houses may indeed suggest that the departure was sudden and unpremeditated. Now, how can slaves just suddenly pack up and leave? Just drop all everything and leave. And here's the evidence that this is what happened. It's unbelievable unless you accept the biblical account that all these Israelite slaves just suddenly left Egypt in the great Exodus movement. I read to you what the biblical account says in Exodus chapter 12 and in verse 41. It came to pass at the end of the 430 years, on that selfsame day, it came to pass that all the armies of the Lord went out from the land of Egypt. Well, personally, I think that explains why the slaves left suddenly and unpremeditatively. Now, archaeologists say, generally, that there is no record in Egypt of the Exodus or of the Israelite slaves, for that matter. Well, I think that's because they were looking for it in the wrong place. They're looking for it at the end of the 18th or 19th dynasty, but if you look for it at the end of the 12th dynasty, I believe you do find a record. You see, this, these 10 plagues that fell on Egypt prior to the Exodus were absolutely devastating. Listen, Exodus 7, and all the waters that were in the river were turned to blood. The fish that were in the river died. The Egyptians could not drink the water of the river. Well, whether they actually turned to blood or looked like blood doesn't matter. The point is, they couldn't drink the water. Chapter 9. The hand of the Lord will be on your cattle, horses, donkeys, camels, oxen, sheep, a very severe pestilence. All the livestock of Egypt died. Well, you can see how Egypt is dependent upon its livestock, and if they all dropped dead, it must have been an absolute disaster. Then we read, Moses stretched out his hand toward heaven, and the Lord sent thunder and hail. The hail struck throughout the whole land of Egypt, all that was in the field, both man and beast. And the hail struck every herb of the field and broke every tree of the field. All their fruit trees were devastated. And so it absolutely shattered the economy of Egypt. And the locusts went up over all the land of Egypt and rested on all the territory of Egypt. They were very severe. And they covered the face of the whole earth so that the land was dark and they ate every herb of the land and all the fruit of the trees which the hail had left. Here you've got beautiful crops here, but they're all destroyed by locusts, hail, thunder, everything. And Egypt was absolutely laid in the dust. 
Well, there should have been some record of all this in Egypt, if it really happened. And I believe there is a record if you look in the right place. In the Leyden Museum in Holland, there is a papyrus there called the Ipawer Papyrus, and it's to be dated to this time. Now, you listen. Jan's going to read you a translation of it. Plague stalketh through the land, and blood is everywhere. Nay, but many dead men are buried in the river. Nay, but the river is blood. Does a man drink thereof? He rejects it as a human. Nay, but gates, columns, and walls are consumed with fire. Nay, but corn has perished everywhere. The storehouse is bare. So, you see, when we look in the right place, we find that you can take the biblical record seriously and it all fits into place. In our next program, we leave the pyramids of Egypt and travel south to the tombs and temples of Luxor and Karnak. There we will further investigate how biblical history can be both complemented and brought alive by historical facts and archaeological discoveries. Luxor was the capital of Egypt during the reign of King Tutankhamun, and in the rugged hills of the West Bank lies the famed Valley of the Kings, whilst to the east, the beautiful temples of Luxor and Karnak. <laughs> Thank you.